magic in some ways is this living entity, you know, that it's very easy to think of magic as kind of a game, a singular game, but it really, it really isn't. It's very different from most other games. And my metaphor for that is think of a stream, you know, and they, they talk about how, you know, you could scoop up water from a stream, but the day you scoop up the water is different from the different day you scoop up water. That even though it's the same stream, you keep getting different things. Every time you interact with it, it's different because it's ever changing, it's moving. And magic is ever evolving. And so the cool part about magic is that it, it keeps changing what it is. And that the reason people play magic for so long, and our average player length, is, you know, other game people are very envious. Our, our players play forever. And the reason is, it's not the same game. It's not like the game I'm playing now is what I played a year ago. It's similar, it's connected, you know, and that design's role is ever, you know, I, I'm constantly making new games, essentially. I mean, they're all part of this meta game we call magic, but I just keep making new games that are similar to games you've played before enough that, you know, your learning curve is pretty good because you know a lot walking in. But, you know, Innistrad is different than Scars of Mirrodin, which is different than Zendikar. I mean, each was its own game and had its own play. And the cool thing about magic, essentially, is, you know, you walk in invested. And so the next set, it's like, I know so much that my barrier to entry is tiny versus a normal game. So the life cycle of a set starts many years out. Uh, Mark Rosewater tends to be the keeper of kind of the five-year plan for magic. From there, design usually starts a couple years out. Uh, and it's, it's on the big sets, it's recently been, been Mark heading that up with a team of designers, which usually includes a couple of his guys on his team like Ken Nagel, uh, plus a couple developers uh, oftentimes just to lend that sensibility to the design process as well as we'll, we'll throw in some, some different people from other teams. So they work on that for, for several months, checking in every so often with me, with our vice president, letting them know how things are going. And then there, there's a two month period called, we call divine, which is a cross between design and development. And that's when the developers really start getting involved. Development is, does two things. First of all, it's a second pass to continue just generally what is the set about in the major themes. You get more eyes on the, twice as many people to look at the set without meetings that are twice as large. But whereas design skills are more bent towards making new stuff, the developers are a little better at being like, well, how can we modify these cards either with costing or different text to get to make them play a little more smoothly. I think when Magic started, top-down design was very important. If you look at Alpha, what Richard did in Alpha, in order to Garfield, Magic's creator, um, what Richard did in Alpha was he really sort of said, well, what would you expect to see? What kind of card, you know, he went and found fantasy tropes and then turned them into cards. It wasn't like he said, oh, I have a creature that's white with protection in First Strike. What would it be? Oh, maybe it would be a white knight. You know, that's not how it, it worked. He had white knight. I want white knight. Well, what would a white knight do? And in fact, like, I think protection even came into existence because like, well, it should be protected somehow. And he came up with that whole mechanic. And so early magic was very much about what do you expect to see? And let's make the mechanics match that. I kind of thought it was just going to begin and end with the core sets. Because uh, that's where you get to hit all the familiar notes over and over again. Dragon, oh. angel, basilisk, oh. vampire, etc. But Mark Rosewater kind of took the ball and ran with it with Innistrad with the gothic horror theme and, and really pulled all the tribes together plus all these other different tropes uh, and started his design that way. Uh, and I was pretty blown away by how it turned out. Uh, the fact that, and we're hearing compliments left and right. I am Dracula. And the reason Innistrad has been so successful, I believe, is that there's a love for the horror genre that people have. We didn't invent it, we didn't make it, we didn't make the horror genre. We didn't make people have a love for vampires or werewolves or zombies because mass media and lots of other things did that. But what we were able to do is say, here's an awesome thing, you love this thing, can we take it and make it magic in a way that is both magic-y but also has enough of its original essence that you, the thing you loved about it is still there. So like when I designed like zombies, for example, magic's had zombies forever. You know, it's not like zombies are new to magic. But I said, you know what, it's never happened. I've never been able to make a zombie deck that act like, like the zombies from Dawn of the Dead, like from a zombie movie, you know? Like the best zombie deck I can remember was in Tempest, which was like this speedy hatred, you know, burn you out fast deck. I'm like, how is that zombies? I mean, you know, it, it's never felt right. And so I set out to say, well, I'm gonna make zombies the way you expect zombies to be. And like, you know, the thing about a zombie is, 
Any one zombie is not that scary. You know, anybody can take on a zombie. That's the, the, the essence of zombies. It makes them kind of cool is one zombie is not scary. But is two zombies scary? Is 10 zombies scary? Is 26 zombies scary? You know, at what point is it what's kind of scary? And so we imbued in it. I mean, a lot of what we've been trying to do is say, how can I get the essence of what I want, the resonance of it, and bring that back to the game, but in a way that doesn't splinter things. And so we've kind of took all the things we've learned over the years so that we can go back to do what Richard did, but with a, an overlying view that ties it all together so it's not uh, one of a piece as it was early on. What we're doing is we're keeping more of what design wanted while still accomplishing our goals of balancing it. So, so all of, really all the things that Mark Rosewater, I think his major things he cared about with the uh, vampires, the zombies, all the tribes, the horror feel, we, we managed to keep everything he cared about there, almost everything, while delivering you know, a, a relatively balanced environment, both for limited and casual and constructed. And, you know, there's a little bit of frustration that some people have with every set. No magic set is perfect, but we managed to, I think, deliver what we, what we needed to do with, whilst preserving his great ideas. When we sat down, day one of doing Innistrad Design, I said to my team, I believe all this is going to hinge on the werewolves. I'm like, if we could sell the werewolves, I, I, I believe like the set will be a success. And the reason is, werewolves were the one thing we were bringing to the table that we really hadn't ever nailed in magic. Magic had done vampires, it's done zombies and ghosts and humans. I mean, there's elements we hadn't done, but I mean, we've done all those things. There's things you have seen. And I mean, I think magic had done three werewolves in the history of the game, all of which, to be honest, kind of sucked. You know, and I'm like, okay, we're doing the horror genres, you know, werewolves are very iconic, and magics, we've kind of never succeeded with them. So I said to my team, we need to succeed. Like, like it was true to me. I said, like, if we can succeed with werewolves, that, that's the, that'll say to the players, look, this is it. This is what we're doing. And I, I felt like everything would hinge on it. So I said, okay, how do we do werewolves? And I said, well, okay, what do you expect a werewolf to be? Well, it's got to be human some of the time and a werewolf some of the time, and it has to change back and forth. Oh, okay. And so we sort of walked down that path. Now, we actually did uh, what we call day night, a day night mechanic, where the way it worked is you would bring out something that cared about day or night, and it would bring out the day night card, you know, and it, I think it came out sun side up, and then all the rules were on the card. The card said, I'm going to tell you when it's day, when it's night, just follow what I do, what I say to do. And the way it worked is whenever any player cast a spell, it's kind of advanced on the track. And there was like three tracks on the sun side, and three tracks on the moon side. And so whenever someone would play something, it would, it would advance. And then when it turned to night, there's a whole bunch of creatures that are like, I change at night. Um, they weren't double-sided, they were single-sided, but you know. And so you have this weird environment where it's like, it's day, and then usually one person liked day better than night based on the board state. So one guy was like, I want to make it night. The other guy's, I don't want to be night, you know. And so the guy who wanted night was casting spells. The guy who didn't want night was trying not to cast spells. Um, and then once it became night, then you reverse that I'm trying to cast spells, and it was kind of fun. Um, and so, and the other neat thing that happened is everything switched at once. Like, not just to the werewolf switch, but you know, all the other creatures got nafted at the same time. Uh, now, it ended up being that you had this weirdness where it, you had this card you cared about, and then sometimes the things that cared would go away, and you had to still care about it, even though nothing on the board cared, because it might care in the future. Um, and so it got a little overwhelming, but I think the, the whole tracking of casting spells got brought back to the werewolves when we did the werewolf mechanic, because I loved the idea of both players get to interact because magic is at its best when everybody is involved and invested in what's going on. And so the werewolves, to do it right, I'm like, look, I want the guy who has the werewolf to want the werewolf. Because, look, he's a human. The human, eh, the human's not what makes the werewolf awesome. The werewolf's what makes the werewolf awesome. So if we do it correct, one guy goes, I want a werewolf. My werewolf's going to rock your world. I want a werewolf. And the other guy should be, I'm definitely afraid of your werewolf. I don't want you to have the werewolf. And I wanted to create some game where the both sides are like, okay, we have a little metagame going on. You know, you're on the werewolf plan. I'm on the not werewolf plan. And that there was nice diversity and, and things were happening so that they had a dynamism, a dynamism to it. That, that it was, you know, the game had a cool sort of back and forth in which the werewolves were the center of everything. I found it hard to evaluate because to me, the coolness of double-faced cards are actually the two different images. Here's what looks on one side, here's what looks on the other side. But the playtest didn't have any illustration at all. The art doesn't come until later. 
or you have to f design the cards and know all this stuff. You don't just pay artists to design things for cards that haven't even been made yet. So uh, I thought it was probably right, but by the end I was pretty sure it was right, but you know, not entirely sure until you actually see people enjoy it. Magic is normally good. I'm very proud of our magic world, but every once in a while you have a set that just kind of clicks where everything's just kind of perfect, and I feel the Innistrad is kind of that perfect storm. The Innistrad set is, I mean, it's, it is a triumph from R&D. It is one of the best designed and developed sets of all time. It's absolutely incredible. The limited format is one of the best limited formats ever. For constructed, it's had a big impact, but it doesn't seem like there's anything broken. There's a couple cards that push the boundaries a little bit, like Lilian and Snapcaster Mage. But so far, they don't, they don't seem broken so much as they just seem like aces, you know? Like they seem like the best things going on. And uh, it's fun. There's so many different types of cards that are good. It's, it's interesting. And I think that there's a lot of cards that people haven't even got to figure out how to use yet. They're going to become good later once people figure out what to do with them. So it's a perfect 10. It's one of the best sets of all time. If you like Innistrad, you should like Dark Ascension. It is more Innistrad than what Dark Ascension is. You know, I mean, there's some new twists. Uh, I mean, the big idea is, in my mind, the humans are kind of the prota protagonist of the story. And, you know, we come to Innistrad and things are looking bad. And you get to Dark Ascension, oh, they're worse. You know, and so we have some new mechanics. And we're, we're definitely trying to get the sense of the humans on the brink of extinction and, and the monsters all closing in. And so if you like monsters, Dark Ascension has a, a lot of good monster moments. And, um, you know, there's more double face cards. And I mean, like, we definitely take what we did in Innistrad and you know, tweak it a little bit. So if there's things like, ooh, they could do such and such, well, hey, wait for Dark Ascension, maybe, maybe we will. Grasp of Darkness is two black mana for an instant to give target creature minus four minus four until end of turn.